Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I'm excited for part two of my interview with Ashley Williams, who is a member of the Rust core team, as well as interim executive director of the Rust Foundation. And today we'll be discussing a bit more about Rust language features than last time. And as usual, I edited the interview and then added the visuals afterward. Anyway, let's get started. In terms of recent evolution to the language itself, well, the whole language is recent, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> it's all relative, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, but one of the things I really appreciated uh, in the past was the non-lexical lifetimes. I think that greatly improved the usability of the language. Are there other similar plans going forward of things to do to make Rust more approachable to people while still maintaining the kind of static analysis it has? Yeah, absolutely. So I will definitely just key in on the maintaining the static analysis it has. That is not going to go away. I think what we would probably do is look for new interesting ways to be able to leverage that, which is like what non-lexical lifetimes actually allowed us to do. But when we think about other ways to kind of improve large ergonomic changes like that, I think the efforts right now are really to figure out how we can get a reliable stream of user ergonomic needs. So the question of what is learnable, what does the Rust learning curve mean? And what does it mean that Rust is hard to learn? I think getting some significantly more clarity on that and putting some structure around receiving that feedback is really going to be what leads us to some more of those ideas. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Of course, there's different kinds of issues, as you just pointed out, different things that might cause different stumbling blocks for different people. One of the things that I think looks interesting that I've seen in, among the various possible proposals for the language is the things like try blocks or OK wrapping that might be something to make it more approachable for people, depending where they're coming from. Do you think something like that might possibly make it into the language? Yeah. So... As I said, I want to be careful as somebody who is on the core team, like I don't want to go like, yeah, that should definitely be part of the language because that's, I would think like a misuse to a certain extent of my position in power. But what this kind of dives into is a couple of topics and ideas that I'm really, really interested in. And so one of these things is Strauss-Strope's rule. Are you familiar? I'm pronouncing his name so bad there. Someone in the YouTube comments or something is going to be like, you messed it up and that's fine. I'm sorry in advance. But the rule is that for new features in general, users insist on what they call loud or explicit syntax. And I'll get into a second about what explicit means because there's so many devils in that detail. And then for established features, people People want terse notation. And so when I think about language design, there's so many different timelines in a language. So there's like a language is new and then it becomes more mature, just it grows over time. And then there's this general set of adopters journey, which is like the majority of your users have been using your language for how much amount of time. And so when we look at Rust, for a while, the majority of users using Rust were new to Rust, but we're slowly starting to see that the majority of users have now been probably using Rust for about a year or two. We do a community survey every year, which helps us understand this. And that group is getting more mature. And then you always have people's individual journeys with Rust, which is you start having no experience with it, and then you grow it over time. Now, the interesting problem about these timelines is that they create different needs for different users. And so for many folks having to do OK wrapping, for example, like, I don't know, every function that I write in Rust usually returns a result. And at the bottom of my function body, I've got this OK, usually OK unit. I don't know. And so people are like, oh, we've had to type this so much. Like, I get this. I get the result type. I don't want to have to do this anymore. This feels like a stumbling block. And I do think it is true that we also see a lot of beginners stumble on this. And the real question here is, does beginners stumbling on that is that instructive and useful in teaching them something about the language? Or is it just a boilerplate mess that we should just absolutely get rid of if it's not helping folks? And answering that question is really, really hard. So for me, I kind of always expected potentially that OK wrapping may land in the language. But the real question is, at what point in Rust's journey should it? So yeah, I mean, there's always the chance that somebody really champions this topic and really wants to push it forward. And to anybody listening who has the thing that they really want done in Rust, if you feel passionate about this, that's really step one to getting anything done in Rust at all. And then being able to tell that story with Rust values and get it implemented, that's really the bulk of the work. 
but being able to demonstrate that this is ergonomic. I still think we struggle when we talk about what is more learnable versus what is not more learnable. In talks that I've given, I've talked about ergonomics as being like 80% familiarity. Most people think the lack of okay wrapping is not ergonomic because it's unfamiliar. And so trying to figure out ways that we can define these things and as we define learnability, learnable for who, I would say we don't have as formal of a discipline around it as we want. And I say we as in both Rust and I think the industry at large, there's just all those axes of complexity. I personally find them very, very exciting, but I don't think we've learned how to really flex that muscle as a community of language designers yet. That makes a lot of sense. (laughs) On a slightly different topic, more about implementation, I've seen this chalk effort trying to implement the Rust trait system using a deductive logic engine. Is that just designed to make the underpinning stronger or is it actually supposed to affect what's actually seen to the language Mm -hmm. users? Yeah, so chalk is really trying to do some formalization of the trait system structure like within Rust. There's no goal for that to be able to change the semantics of the language. However, formalization efforts help improve the language's ability to change, right? So with the more formalizations, our ability to be able to change things in the language improves dramatically. So I wouldn't say that chalk will lead to semantic changes in the language, but it does make changing the language easier, which will inevitably have some effect on the language because it will help affect the process by which those changes are proposed and implemented. Does that make sense? Sure, that makes a lot of sense. So sort of a little question, do you consider Rust to be a functional language? Uh, (laughs) I saw this in your list of questions and I was like, oh, this one will be fun. So I guess to start, as somebody who is not formally trained in computer science, I studied neuroscience and philosophy in university. I know words have meanings and there's some somewhat formal definitions of what a functional language is and many people who feel very passionately about that definition. So I will walk carefully. When people ask me, is Rust a functional language? I'll usually dodge exactly the way I'm dodging right now. But one of the things that I tell a lot of people, particularly people who are very fluent in another language, usually one of the high level scripting languages or maybe Java, is I do say that in general, Rust is absolutely not object oriented. And that if you come from a place where there's a lot of object oriented paradigms, like that's how you think through problems, learning Rust will mean that you are going to learn new ways to think about problems. Because one of the biggest things I've seen in learning curve with Rust is not any of Rust's primitives so much as if you try to implement something, let's say a doubly linked list, right? I'm trying to implement it in Rust you're going to have a bad time. Rust resists some of these patterns that would otherwise be totally reasonable data structure choices in another language. And so when trying to decide, oh, is this object oriented? Is this functional? I definitely think Rust tends towards the functional side. Would I say it's purely functional the way, you know, something like Haskell or Lisp? No, it's not. But these kind of paradigms are a gradient. And there's both the language itself, does it have the affordance to be used in an object-oriented way? Does it have the affordance to be used in a functional way? You can do both. I think you'll have a better time using Rust in a functional way, but there's absolutely things in Rust that I would say are idiomatic that wouldn't be purely functional. So uh, what are they looking at next? Oh, sure. Can the Rust compiler still get faster? (laughs) Oh my gosh. So I will, uh, I think, (laughs) I'm one of those people who thinks that the Rust compiler is fast. Much of that has to do with my privilege. Like I have a computer that's really fast. I'm not on Windows. Compile times are slower on Windows. But I know that people want to squeeze so much more performance out of the compiler. And yes, I'm certain that the compiler can get faster. Nicholas Nethercody, who is doing a lot of the compiler optimization work, a lot of it was him just digging into the compiler and finding places to do it. And he was working at Mozilla. He's moved on now, but he wasn't even necessarily paid to work on Rust. This was almost a side project for him. And I think for anybody who feels really passionately about compiler optimization, spending some time to sit in there and dig, like I think that there's probably still some low hanging fruit there that just somebody focused on it can do it. Now, That being said, how huge will those jumps be? Are we talking about like shaving a small amount of time versus not? 
I have not personally dug into the compiler and looked at those things. For folks that are interested in doing this though, Nicholas's blog on his journey through the Rust compiler optimizations is just absolutely fantastic. On like a larger scale of how much faster the compiler can get, there's a couple of efforts that I'm particularly focused and excited about. And it's really kind of generalized this formalization and specification work that we're looking to do. You talked a little bit about shock, but even just specifying the language. I think as we get more of that formalization done, I think that we are going to find more things. And one of the things that Rust has always kind of done, and it's funny because we don't hear this a lot anymore, but at the beginning of Rust, it was always like Rust took academia and made it applicable in the industry. We still have really close relationships with academic institutions. And I think with an independent foundation, we're going to be able to strengthen those even more. And so between all of the formalization effort we're seeing happen in Rust with specification efforts and things like that, and I think stronger relationships with academia, I think that there's definitely ways that we could see the compiler get much faster. And I don't think anybody who works on a Rust team thinks that the community thinks the compiler speed is fine. I don't know what will necessarily satisfy folks. I mean, it's interesting. Like, I mean, there's lots of differences between a compiled and an interpreted language, but a sufficiently fast compiler to have the kind of ergonomics that interpreted language has, like maybe that's the level that folks want. I don't know, but we'll get faster. Exactly how I think is yet to be seen. But yeah, I expect that it will, but this is not a promise that like tomorrow the compiler will take zero time. <laughs> be good enough. So what do you find most exciting in the future for Rust? And or do you have any closing words? Yeah. So anybody who works with me on any of the Rust teams would say that Ashley's kind of like chronically pessimistic. So I think the thing that I'm most excited about now is we are at a real inflection point for Rust, kind of from like a socioeconomic perspective, which is to say like Rust is about to get super adopted into a lot of enterprises. And this is often a really critical time for open source projects. And so viewing this as an opportunity and not necessarily as a threat, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is if Rust can incentivize all of the companies that are currently adopting it to contribute back teams of contributors, like in order for folks to focus on this, it needs a champion. If we also see teams of champions coming out of that usage, our ability to take Rust from where it is today to the cool kind of already designed things in the future, I think that that will be particularly exciting. I think if we can figure out a way to make working on open source and keeping Rust open source participatory and transparent, have that survive this wave of adoption, I think that'll be really positive. Selfishly, if I had to pick maybe something technical that I'm particularly excited about. So I have not been able to focus on this as much as I would have liked, but one of my favorite potential futures of Rust is with WebAssembly. And I know you'd maybe wanted to talk about that. So I'm gonna take the opportunity to plug this here. I think that Rust being the language for WebAssembly makes a lot of sense in a lot of different ways. And with WebAssembly kind of as a very portable target that can, people are using it as a container replacement now, almost more than a JavaScript replacement, which I think is like the fun surprise of WebAssembly, neither web nor assembly. But I think Rust being able to really target that well will let Rust go to a lot of new places and just kind of open up the surface area that Rust can target. I think we've seen a huge influx of web developers starting to get interested in Rust because of the potential of this story. And I think that this really helps Rust's general thrust, which is let's make a generation of systems programmers out of a group of people who never thought they could be systems programmers. WebAssembly is awesome in and of itself, but I also think it's like a great gateway drug, which goes like, hey, you like web stuff, like do some web stuff with Rust. And people are like, oh, okay. And then they're like, oh, maybe I should write an operating system now. And you're like, yeah, that's awesome. Rust is a fascinating language because if you can have patience for how many things that you have to learn inside of it are, if you start small, it's a language you can really, really grow with. And I think that that idea of empowering systems programmers, I think that's really happening. And I think we've seen WebAssembly be that first step for a lot of folks and what people are doing with containers and serverless and edge compute in particular with WebAssembly, I think is awesome. 
Awesome. Any further final words or are we good? Final words. Um, well, it's not entirely clear to me whether or not the foundation will exist before or after you might be watching this video, but definitely keep an eye out for that. If you have questions or concerns, we really want to be having folks have a real conversation about it. We really want folks to participate. We think it's going to be a really great step for Rust. And so as a final word, come participate, join the Rust group. It would be great. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye. Bye.